I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, and this is Sustainable Hawaii, streaming live every Tuesday at noon from the Think Tech Hawaii studio in downtown Honolulu. I seem to have gotten a frog just as we came on air. <coughs> Excuse me. We're going to talk about climate changes occurring today in Hawaii and the U.S. Affi affiliated Pacific Islands and how it's impacting coastal infrastructure, terrestrial ecosystems, ocean and coastal ecosystems, and communities and cultures. Hawaii and the six U.S. affiliated Pacific Islands, which are American Samoa, the Federated States of Micronesia, Guam, <clears throat> the Marshall Islands, the Northern Mariana Islands, and Palau, include 2,000 islands with about 1.9 million inhabitants, <clears throat> excuse me, representing numerous languages and cultures. Here to talk with us today about the climate changes affecting these islands, including us in Hawaii, is Zina Grechny, Project Specialist for the Pacific Islands Regional Climate Assessment. Ms. Grechny received a Master of, an Environment, of Environmental Management from the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. Her program of study centered on climate change adaptation and freshwater and coastal governance, with a particular focus on small islands. Welcome, Zina. Aloha. Thank you, Kirsten. It's great to be here. I want to ask you first, what brought you to Hawaii besides the fact that we are a chain of small islands? <laughs> yes, that's a great question. Um, I actually first came to Hawaii in 2009 uh, with my now husband, um, who grew up on a farm on the windward side of Oahu um, in Waiahole. And um, I didn't know how long I was going to stay in Hawaii at first, but when I got here, I fell in love with the islands and I also learned a lot about how climate change was affecting them and the resources and cultures at risk and um, began working right away on that at the University of Hawaii. Well, tell us about the PERCA, the Pacific Islands Regional Climate Change Assessment. Absolutely. Um, I work as the Sustained Assessment Specialist at Pacific Islands Regional Climate Assessment, which we also call PERCA, um, P-I-R-C-A for short. And PERCA is really uh, engaging scientists, but also resource managers, practitioners in government and business and communities in the process to identify climate risks um, and address them. And um, so my job really is to introduce scientists to practitioners and have that conversation about what practitioners actually need in their everyday work to better deal with the effects of climate change. And then scientists can produce information that fits those needs and is better tailored to their um, to their own terms and formats. So tell us what the region entails. I know I listed the, the actual island nations, but a lot of people don't know where those are. And we have a great slide, I think, that you can walk us through. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if I could see that slide. Um, so our region um, is only the US affiliated Pacific Islands. So we, we don't actually work on all 22 Pacific Islands um, territories and countries, um, but we do work in um, as you said, American Samoa and Guam, which are territories. We work in the Federated States of Micronesia and the Republic of the Marshall Islands, the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, and Palau, which are all uh, affiliated with the United States through the Compact of Free Association. Um, this territory encompasses more than 20,000 islands and um, atolls, and it also encompasses the uh, national marine monuments like Papahanao, Mokuakea, and others. Um, and so it's really a vast region, um, includes tremendous ocean territory. We often refer to the Pacific Islands as, oh, they are often referred to as small island states, but we like to refer to them as large ocean states um, because they encompass so much ocean. It's really fascinating to think of that. It's like a reverse negative. <laughs> it gives them a lot more power in terms of what they control and sort of reframes it in a different uh, light. That's, that's true, because we think of them as such tiny spots in the global, uh, vast global issues. But when you talk about the resources that the ocean has and how they, we are very dependent upon them, it's actually a huge impact that these tiny island nations can have, um, particularly when they bring to light the issues that you're bringing to us today. Absolutely. What are some of those issues? And I know that you've given us some slides on the indicators you're assessing. Yeah, so the Pacific Islands Regional Climate Assessment in their last report identified a number of key indicators of climate change. These are um, indications in the physical environment, changes that we're seeing, ways that we know climate change is happening throughout our region. 
Um, and those include um, changes in rainfall patterns. Um, and in some cases, this means particularly on atolls and low-lying islands that fresh water may become more limited in the future and is becoming more limited already. Um, we see sea level rise, which brings more severe uh, and more fre frequent coastal flooding and erosion. Um, it means changes in our marine ecosystems, um, including ocean acidification and um, ocean temperatures rising, which threaten our coral ecosystems and also our, our benthic fisheries, um, deeper ocean fisheries. Uh, it means uh, that our native plant and animal communities, uh, particularly um, those that are in rare and endangered, um, may face more stress and possibly extinction in the future. Um, and it means uh, threats to indigenous cultures and human communities, especially those living on those low-lying atolls and along the coasts, as their resource bases and their land bases um, become threatened by climate change and sea level rise. And I think you actually have a graph of some of these in the previous indicator slide. Yes, absolutely. Oh. Um, so uh, this is a pictorial representation from our 2012 report of um, the different ways that climate is changing, the different factors of our climate um, that are experiencing change. Um, and so this sort of um, demonstrates uh, visually um, the things that, that I was just talking about in terms of uh, habitats and species distribution is changing. Um, in Hawaii, we're seeing base flow in our streams declining. Um, and of course, uh, as sort of a driver of all of this, we're seeing carbon dioxide concentrations rising. Um, so well, this yes. is really an amazing graphic because it's like a modern illustration of the ahupua'a concept of, of the Native Hawaiians before colonial contact and how they managed the land. And we're beginning to go back and use that in not just our scientific approaches, but in our uh, city and statewide planning. So it's lovely to see this. Tell us a little bit more about the water issues because you know we know that we've had a lot of rainfall unseasonably, but at the, and it's caused um, a lot of flash flooding. Explain to our audience how that can cause drought and actual, actually how do we account for the lower level in our freshwater streams? Yeah, that's a really good observation that we have seen a lot of um, rainfall. Um, recently with the recent El Nino pattern. Um, and that's one feature of the Pacific Islands is that their rainfall is highly variable from year to year. And a lot of that has to do with the El Nino Southern Oscillation, which is a pattern um, that we see um, of ocean temperatures and air temperatures and pressure changing um, year to year and causing us to have less rainfall in some years and more severe um, and, and um, sort of, you know, devastating, almost dangerous rainfall in other years. Um, but overall, over uh, the last decade, um, rainfall in Hawaii and also some of the other eastern Pacific islands in Micronesia has decreased um, at overall on average. Um, so we have to separate out. This is a, the difficult task of climate scientists, and sometimes I'm glad that I'm not actually doing the hydrologic modeling. I'm not actually doing the, the climate modeling myself, that I have this job of translating it in, instead, because it's a difficult task to separate out what is climate change at times versus other uh, phenomena like, and like, so, the El Nino. like the El Nino or like the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which also has a large influence. And, but those oscillations are actually being impacted themselves, right? So although mm -hmm. those are natural cycles, they aren't occurring in their natural cycle. So That's correct? right, and that further complicates um, the projections for the future for rainfall in particular. So with sea level rise, um, there's less uncertainty in terms of the magnitude and, well, there are actually, there's a lot of uncertainty in the magnitude of sea level rise too, but in terms of what's already happening, um, it can see sea level rise where with rainfall, we may need to wait a little while to see that trend. And it, particularly, we don't know what's yet what's going to happen with El Nino. The science is improving. We're constantly getting a better understanding of what El Nino um, Southern Oscillation means and how it affects the Pacific Islands, but we still need more time and research on that. So in your research, what are you seeing as the most um, poignant messages that we're getting out of that long list that you gave us, which is already pretty astounding? Absolutely. That's a great question. Um, 
I would say that sea level rise, the coastal flooding and erosion has a lot of implications, um, both for Hawaii, but also for the U.S. affiliated Pacific Islands. So we're looking at atoll nations um, like in Micronesia, in the Marshall Islands, um, people may lose their entire land base. So these are islands where they're only a few meters above sea level rise, uh, above sea level at the highest point. And um, they're starting to think about um, questions of migration, um, possibly in the future. Um, should they lose their land and resource base or should they need to, um, to regroup in another location as a country? Well, we know that in many locations, people are already having to move. Um, we, I'm thinking of examples in the Aleutian Islands. And I remember at the World Conservation Congress, the Tongan uh, minister, I believe it was the prime minister was here, and they already have uh, begun moving back communities. Uh, are there other examples in the U.S. affiliated islands that, that they're actually having to move now? In the U.S. affiliated islands, I think it's, it, people are starting to plan for this into the future. And I think the, uh, the idea of it and the projections um, have a lot of, bear a lot of impact on their future planning for their families and for um, the future of their communities. Um, I don't know personally of any examples of um, places in the U.S. affiliated islands that have re relocated to date. Um, but in places like Papua New Guinea and Vanuatu, I believe um, it's already uh, much more um, tangible. And in the Western Pacific, we've seen the highest rates of sea level rise um, in the last 30 years in the, in, of the entire world, um, which may or may not continue. But um, in any case, it's really uh, put a, a fine point on the need to move quickly. And I know a question our viewers might have that I had Chip Fletcher, Dr. Fletcher from UH answer yes. on this show a while ago, and maybe you can help remind us is why is that, that in certain areas the sea level rises more than others? Because intuitively that doesn't connect, you know? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I mean, Dr. Fletcher would be a much better person <laughs> to answer this question than I, um, and I'm glad that he answered on, a, on your show, but ocean processes are complex, and um, winds are, prevailing winds over the Pacific Ocean have a lot of in, uh, import onto the ocean, um, the sea level and ocean currents. Mm -hmm. And I think um, in certain years, in certain decades, um, there are trends towards those winds pushing the water physically mm -hmm. to the western half of the Pacific, and then it may change in other years and push back. So I've heard that this trend towards um, western sea level rise being highest may actually change in the next decade. Well, that's pretty scary and has a great implication for us here in Hawaii, since we're Central Pacific. And we're going to take a short break, and then we'll get back and return with us to talk with uh, Zena Grechny from the East-West Center's PERCA, the Pacific Islands Regional Climate Assessment, and we'll find out how that's going to affect Hawaii. Aloha, everybody. My name is Mark Shklov. I'd like you to join me for my program, Law Across the Sea, on thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha. Hi, I'm Stacy Hayashi with the Think Tech Hawaii show, Stacy to the Rescue, highlighting some of Hawaii's issues. You can catch it at Think Tech Hawaii on Mondays at 11 a.m. Aloha. See you then. Aloha. I'm Carl Campagna, host of Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. I hope you join us over the next several weeks as we take a deep dive into biofuels in Hawaii and explore the alternative fuels supply chain necessary for the local and global transition towards transportation fuel sustainability. Join us as we have good conversations with our farmers, our producers, our conversion technologies, our investors, and our legislators as we try to achieve our transportation sustainability goals. See you soon. Hi, we're back with Zena Grechny, and we're talking about the Pacific Islands Climate Change Assessment um, with regard specifically to Hawaii and our U.S.-affiliated uh, neighbor island states. So what are some of the impacts that we're seeing in Hawaii and needing to plan for? Yeah, well, I think one of the greatest impacts that we're seeing right now is sea level rise and its um, effect on uh, exacerbating coastal erosion that we already have. Um, so 
Um, an example is Waikiki Beach, um, which already depends mm -hmm. on large imports of sand to renourish the beach um, on a periodic basis. Which um, costs millions and millions of it's dollars. It's very expensive, that's right. Um, and sea level rise, a lot of other beaches are eroding too, and sea level rise just exacerbates this, increases the rate of that erosion, um, and, and can cause inland flooding as well. Um, so a lot of people think that um, sea level rise will only overwash roadways and the beaches right at the coast. Um, but it actually raises the water table um, in back of, of the coastal development um, and can push up through the storm drains, which are connected to the ocean. Um, so fresh water can actually inundate areas, um, pockets throughout the in, inland areas of Waikiki and other places. It already does this periodically in Mapunapuna, as um, Dr. Chip Fletcher likes to right. point out. And also in Waikiki, because we've had yes. several instances in the last few years of having to close the beach because our storm drains can't accommodate the drainage. That's right. And they've overflowed, and it's caused tremendous pollution and really impacting the tourism industry. That's right. And so sea level rise just means this will get worse. Um, sort of um, no, no question about that at this point. Um, just we're not sure exactly how fast that will happen. Um, and, but the Coastal Geology Group at the University of Hawaii has modeled this, and they have maps showing one foot, two feet of sea level rise. Um, and even after just one foot, which is uh, a middle of the road projection for 2050, you see pockets of Waikiki being flooded persistently, or at least periodically, um, all, over, um, all over that district. So, um, and then another thing that climate change does with tourism in particular um, is to change the ocean chemistry and to affect our coral reef ecosystems, which is a major draw for, tours, for tourism here, divers, um, people going to Hanama Bay to snorkel and see, see the reef and see the fish. And it's all connected. The fish um, depend on the reef for their food source, and so if we lose the reef, we lose fish as well. Right, and we've seen that actually in, in my lifetime in Hawaii. It's been absolutely astounding where in my favorite uh, snorkel spots how many fish uh, are no longer there and certainly the total number is, is just way down. It's really quite disconcerting. You hear everyone talk about it all the time. Um, we have a coral reef slide, I think, that indicates what some of these impacts are. Yeah, so um, this actually shows uh, bleaching events um, projected for 2030 on the top half and 2050 on the lower half. Um, and you can see that the bleaching events become much more frequent in 2050 as we go. And by 2050, scientists uh, are thinking that the reef will not have time between these bleaching events to recover. Um, and so that might be a, a tipping point when the reef can no longer recover. Reefs are resilient. I think you recently might have heard that um, a, one scientist might have declared uh, the Great Barrier Reef uh, dead. Somebody wrote an obituary for it. It was kind of, um, it was sort of a, a hyperbole. It was mm -hmm. overstating. Um, but it, it does send the message that we're in great trouble. I saw that a lot of scientists pushed back on that, actually, and said, no, our reefs are really resilient. And, and this current bleaching event only affected about 20% of the Great Barrier Reef. So Nonetheless, <laughs> that's 20%. That's Absolutely. That's, that's, a, that's a huge, worrisome number. Um, and I think we need to be doing the things here in Hawaii to identify what might make reefs more resilient. Um, mm -hmm. And that's something that our program can help with in terms of providing information about case studies where reefs have been resilient and what are the factors that contribute to that and what can we do as managers to encourage it. And I know one of our guests on the show, uh, Dr. Ruth Gates, is is doing intensive research in how to make reefs more resilient. That's right. And so the work you're doing is extremely important because you're providing her and everyone else working on this issue with the data. So as you're making calls for the collection of that data, people really need to heed that call and provide you the information because it's impacting all of the research that's being done out there. That's right, absolutely. We are always looking to make new partnerships and new connections with researchers who are doing this work and help them to uh, get their word out more broadly and to translate it for a broader audience in, in coastal resource management or business or whatever audience might be in need of this type of information. So we hope to make those connections more in the future. And I know that you're, you're doing a call right now for um, information for people to tell you the kinds of information they're looking for. Yes, that's right. So we're doing a survey right now um, 
Um, it's informal, so it's not a, a scientific survey per se, as you might think of in the social sciences, but it's really just to get the public's input. Anybody living in Hawaii or the U.S. affiliated Pacific Islands who might have an interest in climate change and wants to know what's going to happen, what is already happening in their environments and in their areas of work, um, we'd like them to take our survey. It only takes about three minutes. And um, this is a way that we're gathering input for our next assessment, um, which will be released probably in the next year upcoming. And that survey can be found on? It can be found on our website at perca.org. It's P-I-R-C dot O-R-G. P-I-R-C, not A? P-I-R-C. C. -I -R -C. C okay. A dot O-R-G. Okay. Thank you. Yes. There is an A. Good, good, good. P-I-R-C-A dot O-R-G. Okay. Terrific. And I know you brought us some interesting slides on the sea level rise, too. Um, let's take a look at those. That's right. So this is a compilation of sea level data and future projections um, dating all the way back to 1700 and then projecting out to 2100. This is from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is a, a global assessment of climate change and the knowledge about climate change from our science, uh, scientific data. Um, and as you can see, there are two scenarios. One is the red line going up. That's a high emissions um, and a high greenhouse gas concentrations scenario. And then the low one is in blue. Um, so even with curbing, significantly curbing our greenhouse gas emissions and eliminating greenhouse gases from our atmosphere, we still see some level of sea level rise. But um, this uh, scenario can um, sort of be our goal um, if we're thinking about uh, preventing the worst impacts of sea level rise. Now, now, that raises the question, though, if we're lowering CO2 levels, some people say, and there's still sea level rise, they might be poking holes in our, our climate change claims. Why is that happening? That's a good point. I mean, I think there's a, a very large difference between um, about a foot of sea level rise or less and three feet, one meter of sea level rise. There's a huge difference for our atoll nations, for example, which live within, do much of their, of their lives and have much of their resources in between those two um, levels in terms of um, sustenance, fishing, and um, home, house sites and livelihood. So um, I think it makes a big difference when we talk about numbers. Um, and the, the global um, agreement uh, negotiated the Paris Agreement last year, um, which uh, now has actually gone into effect with um, the threshold of the right number of countries with the right number representing the right number of global emissions signing on to it. Um, I think that just happened in the last month. Um, that was an opportunity to really hash out the numbers and, and, and their importance uh, in terms of warming and in terms of carbon dioxide emissions. So even though we have um, in some success scenarios for lowering CO2 levels in the atmosphere, sea level rise um, continues. And the science of that doesn't mean that we need to stop curbing CO2, right? It's very important to continue because sea level rise happens as a result of other climate uh, impacts, not just the CO2 levels. Right. Absolutely, yes. Um, yeah, the CO2 levels actually drive the warming um, and drive the other impacts that we're seeing. So getting the, the carbon dioxide numbers um, right and tracking our emissions and um, tracking how much we are decreasing those as we follow the Paris Agreement and as countries shift to more renewable um, energy, technology, energy technologies and shift to um, different type of economy, um, right. then we need to be tracking those levels to make sure we're on track to meet those very important worldwide goals. Well, I know that some of the ways in which this acidification, warming, sea level rise is impacting not just the humans, but the different wildlife, right? We did mention the corals, but there's also the monk seals. And Absolutely. our monk seal population has gotten down to a thousand at best estimate. Um, what's happening to the monk seals as the as the ocean warms and the sea level rises? So the unfortunate thing about um, climate change in Hawaii and the U.S. affiliated Pacific Islands is that the places where we're seeing the hardest impacts um, tend to be in the ocean and at the coastline and up high in our mountain ecosystems. And those tend to be the places where we have the most rare and endangered native species. Mm -hmm. um, so species like monk seals, um, like lies in albatross, others that are, um, that are unique to Hawaii and the Pacific Islands um, live in these uh, very um, narrow bands of um, elevation. Uh, 
And um, on coral atolls, like in Papahano Mokuakea National Marine Monument, wave overwash and sea level inundation is a major concern. At the upper elevations, avian malaria, which is expanding because of temperatures warming at higher elevations and mosquito population expanding its range upward, um, that, that has a concern for our native bird population. So kind of on either end of the Maokatimakai spectrum, we have um, major, sea level, major climate change issues that are affecting our native ecosystems. Right, so the circle of all marine life all terrestrial life, including ourselves, is being broken in a nutshell um, by climate change impacts. And you're helping to provide those assessments of how that is happening and what the data is so that we can all look at that data and figure out how to mitigate climate change, but also how to adapt and be more resilient because some of those changes have already happened or are happening mm -hmm. and we need to respond to those. So it's really important work you're doing. Thank you. Um, I want you to remind our listeners again of where to find uh, your survey so they can go on and uh, participate in it. Absolutely. So I'll try to actually get the name right this time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the Pacific Islands Regional Climate Assessment and it's at PIRCA, P-I-R-C-A dot O-R-G. And I know um, you have uh, several partners at PERCA, and, and PERCA is part of the East-West Center, right? Um, PERCA is actually a collaboration of many different entities. Um, okay. So I work at the East-West Center, um, but we have a lot of participation from federal uh, agencies, including NOAA, the USGS, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Department of Interior. Um, we also have uh, partners at the university and its uh, research centers, including the International Pacific Research Center, which does a lot of the future modeling for climate change. At the East-West Center and the University of Hawaii, um, I'm also part of a collaboration called the Pacific RISA, the Pacific Regional Integrated Sciences and Assessments Program, which is an interdisciplinary research program combining social and physical sciences to look at all different aspects of climate change. Um, and so it's really amazing that we've had so many contributors, and it's also um, been one of the reasons for our success. Well, it's terrific that we have so many people working on this really important issue, and that highlights why it's important. I'm really pleased that you came and joined us today, and I hope we'll have you back again. Uh, thank you for joining us at Sustainable Hawaii, and we'll see you next week, Tuesday at noon. Aloha.